don't understand why we can't turn that off. The only place where I see controlling that is in the controls when you're actually in presentation and there's no way that says turn it off. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really weird. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is log in to Can give me just a second. save time. something that we are working on. We're all three of us are coming to this talk. Um, I am Miranda. I am a classroom professor in the School of Education. My name is Courtney Andreg. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Cinematic Arts. And I'm Gloria Doherty. I direct digital learning for George Fox. Uh, and we thought that because we are um, a small but mighty group that it would be helpful for us to know which pathway to take for um, this conversation to kind of know um, what role you play um, in the institution that you support or those kinds of things as we get started. So, um, so you just came in, we'll, we'll make you go right away. So we'll just start on this side. If you just tell us, I'm a designer, I'm an administrator, I'm a faculty, I'm a whatever, I'm a where do you uh, hang out? Uh, I'm an admins as well as the database report writer for our Uh, 
Josh Hendricks, Link Me, Alex, and all of us. A couple other hands. <laughs> <laughs> through with you what it was, how we uh, figured out we had a challenge that we needed to address and the small steps that we took. And we want to give you time to think individually or with each other around um, given the roles that you play in life and conversations that you might want to have. If this um, small model that, that we use to step by step support faculty uh, is really a thing, faculty comes alongside faculty model um, is something that might be effective for your environment um, or if um, there's one other small set of conversations that you really want to have with the remaining of time together today. Um, so for, for us, we all have this shared um, understanding or shared moment. We started with this idea of accessibility, right? This idea of how do we make sure that um, our content is accessible for students? And we realized that wasn't really reactive. We were constantly reacting to what students needed. We've heard a lot about that um, in the last two days about how a student comes and all of a sudden we have to figure something out as opposed to having an environment where a student comes and it's all ready to be figured out. So we started having um, conversations about this idea of universal design. And I know this is a well-known concept, so we wanted to take like 90 seconds and just, this is a key idea for us and for how accessibility ambassadors work. So we took this idea of universal design and to make something that is effective and useful for a wide variety of learners, movers, people, whatever the case may be. Um, and we can apply that principle to our so we really um, wanted to start thinking about accessibility of instruction and accessibility of our um, the tools that we use for instruction. So um, this idea that we want the conversations that we have with faculty to lead to um, an environment or an effective uh, instructional environment where all students So keeping those kind of three big ideas in mind, that we started with accessibility, started unpacking with this idea of universal design and the principles there around um, uh, a product that works for, for all users, um, and then entering into this idea of how do we have meaningful conversations about accessibility and in instruction. Um, Gloria has a couple of questions to get us going, to get us kind of thinking about when we work with students with disabilities or <coughs> Will for a goal poll everywhere. I think we have a, a nice size group that we can just call out some <laughs> ideas, things that we think about. So the first question that uh, we think is helpful is just identifying the common barriers that we've seen students deal with. What do we typically see on our campuses that um, that we need to address for accessibility? Are there certain things that are big themes for you? Hearing impaired mm -hmm. and vision impaired. I mean, I'd say those are the two most common that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one that I think I think really need to have, and especially came to my ears just really recently from the impact the students said that really the question they have to figure out how to do all the time. Um, that they go 
go to the EDS office or whatever and get the accommodation, and they still have to meet with the inspector, and they still have to work out the lesson plan, and they still have to fill out all this, this paperwork, and they have to do it every single class, every single quarter, and they don't understand why. Okay. They feel like they're being punished because they have a disability. Okay. okay. Yeah. Other observations? Things you've experienced or you've heard students experiencing? The course I teach is photography and Photoshop, and at least one student every term, oddly enough, has at least some color blindness. Yeah. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to what degree does that uh, prevent the student from fully participating? Um, I have to. They're still able to participate, but I have to think on a gray scale rather than full color spectrum. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that the colors that are going to be used are different, have enough contrast to be able to be seen differently. How about some of the, what we might call unseen, uh, unreported types of accommodation that a, a student would benefit from? Do you recognize certain students? who do benefit from some accessibility practices, but they don't identify as needing an accommodation, or they may not even know that an accommodation would help them? Attention deficits. Attention deficits. Like I said, diagnosed with just having the option to also read captions is always a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's one that goes undetected. Um, Similarly, dyslexia. Dyslexia, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things where we realize, and we may not even know that there is something that's impeding our learning, but we recognize that some sort of accommodation, like captioning, uh, helps us. And then we start to advocate that more of that can happen. Okay, so another question that we had is what impedes your progress? To, if you're an instructor, or if you're an instructional designer, to make content accessible, what's impeding you? My patience, or time, and trying to get to take over. <laughs> 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 yeah. They don't want to do it. They don't yeah. Play ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Sum it up for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I've had two workshops today that talked about ways to save time and to use your yeah. and learning. I think all required to get the school to buy expensive software. Mm. So I think money is an obstacle because I didn't like, oh yeah. my god, that was saving so much time. You could totally solve that accessibility problem. Oh, well, by the way, it's only going to cost your school twenty five thousand dollars a year. Right. right. Like my school's going to say no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Other things coming to mind. Time, right, stakeholders, money. I know not for me personally, but um, some of the faculty don't know what works in accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Available, needed. Yeah. And isn't it almost frightening to even start asking? <laughs> yeah. Because it's a Pandora's box. It mm -hmm. feels that way, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what we Gloria. discovered, yeah. There's one more. Oh, oh yeah. I was, I'm so sorry. That's no, okay. okay. I, I was just going to add too that the, that Pandora's box also, I think, especially related to to your experience, your um, connectedness to your material. So if you do a lot of in-field studies and you're like, well, you know, how do I accommodate this? I teach music, and you're you're hearing impaired. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. and those kinds of questions. Easily answered, especially if you're Yeah, absolutely. So it can, it can easily start to scale to, to heights that, that we can almost not accommodate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, what I, we wanted to share with you is where we were at in this entire thing. We were um, a typical institution where we felt the external pressures. So um, when you think about the Department of Justice um, and, and some of the issues that are external and feeling that kind of pressure and realizing that not even an institutional mandate 
fixes something like this. There are still all of the struggles of time and you know, motivation and, and the money. Um, and there are points that we really can't affect things. So when we think about libraries and vendors, and you're dealing with databases where some product works, some product does not. So we start to feel immobilized. And so that we've sat in that for a long time, feeling like we can't fix this thing, we can't make external groups fix things, and we feel external pressures to fix things, and it becomes incapacitating for everyone. And that's when we all start to feel pretty pressured. So I've sat in meetings where it is a very uncomfortable conversation trying to figure out what we're going to do about an accommodation. And so uh, where we hit a turning point was uh, applying for an innovation grant within our institution. And our disability services director applied for a grant and worked with IT. And we had, uh, and we had determined that uh, we needed to do an audit, an institutional audit. But then we realized when we look at something like, in our case, Moodle, which is a backbone for delivering digital content, and we were focusing this on digital content for instruction, we pretty much knew what Moodle did and did not do. It's what we were uploading to it that could be the real problem. And we were hesitant to try to load in uh, systems that can detect and give reports. We weren't sure that that was going to help and the grant money that we received wasn't going to cover that. And it's certainly not for the long term. But one thing that we did know is that our faculty are very engaged with the students. If, I, if we have a conversation that says, look, you know, we've got a problem, we've got to fix it right away, that's a difficult conversation. But if we have colleagues who can say, I learned how to start doing this. You want to learn to start doing this. And that's what uh, precipitated the idea of accessibility ambassadors. We've had kind of a culture in the institution of peer mentorship in our professional development. And we felt that this could be the reasonable and really the healthiest, the, more, the most healthy way to approach a very overwhelming situation. So we designed a workshop out of that money, and we developed a stipend, a very modest stipend that was really meant to just signify, we appreciate your time. It really wasn't compensation. For anyone who was interested after this half-day workshop of learning accessibility in, in typical tools that we use, that they might turn and start to mentor and we said things like, would you be willing to have a meeting with your department at a faculty meeting? Would you be willing to get 15 minutes to share? Would you be willing to share a session, maybe a 30-minute session or an hour session, that's offered to everyone at the university and do that periodically? And so we had some folks who went through that workshop and said, yes, I feel this is important and I'm willing to take the time. So it wasn't about money, and they did make the time, and then they started to do this. So this is what we want to share, is the structure of that and what the outcomes have been. And then after we're done with that, we can get you into a site where you can play. If your laptop is here, you can log into a site where you can start to play with what we have used. So um, I wanted to give you kind of the faculty perspective of what we created or what Gloria and Rick created. Um, and in terms of getting cranky stakeholders on board, I think what they did was a really great way of getting us at least um, somewhat um, accustomed to the idea of accessibility and then what my or other faculty members involvement could be. So the half day workshop that Gloria talked about was actually offered in May, so after um, term had ended, and it was offered as a professional development opportunity. Um, and so a way that our university has changed the structure in terms of professional development, we have moved from having 
kind of required faculty conferences at the beginning or end of particular terms to allowing faculty members to um, kind of opt into sessions that have been approved to the Academic Affairs Office as approved faculty development, professional development sessions. And so this was one of those. And um, both Miranda and I and quite a few others um, opted into this half day workshop where um, both digital learning and student services kind of um, offered up this idea of how small steps and what a faculty member does in their own LMS and in their own course space can actually help to um, make accessibility practices a little bit more of a habit rather than um, a reactive um, to a student asking for accommodations. And so we came into that workshop thinking we would learn really cool things about maybe ways in which to tailor our courses to be a little bit more accessible and um, design them for all students. So accessibility practices, not just for individuals who might have a disability, but it's just going to elevate our course overall. And like Gloria mentioned, at the end of that session, um, they gave the, the call for people to get involved. And so initially, um, there are a few of us that said that seems like something, a conversation we want to continue having. Um, and we opted into being accessibility ambassadors for that coming fall semester, um, providing then another professional development opportunity for us to lead those sessions. And so we were engaging in professional development, and then we were also leading, which was also engaging professional development sessions in the fall. Um, we titled these Accessibility Moving Forward, where we as accessibility ambassadors then shared with our faculty um, colleagues in various types of settings what could be done, um, how it wasn't or couldn't um, necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily be a time suck, um, but how to identify places in their own courses that would be beneficial for them to work. And so um, those could have taken any types of formats from um, kind of a a small session within a department meeting, um, taking over a college level meeting to talk about accessibility, or offering brown bag sessions where faculty can kind of opt in to engage in one on one work sessions where we sit down with them and ask them pretty core questions about why are you wanting to think about accessibility? What does your course do? Um, and where are students maybe um, tripping up with their digital content? Um, and so we were in that for a semester and then a semester turned into a year and then a year turned into a year and a half and we're still going because of what we see on the student side of things in terms of outcomes and how it's not just benefiting the students who need accommodations but it's also benefiting the students um, who do but don't realize it um, or students who don't need accommodations but it's just helping the learning process and so you'll get a peek into um, our system that we use to kind of introduce faculty to those small steps that they can make um, to engage in digital content accessibility practices moving forward. Uh, and at the end of the session today, Miranda and I will share some stories about successes that we've seen and kind of outcomes that um, give us hope for um, keeping this on um, and for um, actually improving student experience in digital spaces, but also improving learning. So with that, um, I think we wanted to give you, oh, should I do this too? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, before we push you into our space that has a lot of content, um, two questions that we normally ask colleagues when we sit down with them to talk about accessibility is, first we give them a little like warning of like, you're going to see many things here um, and you don't need to do all of them. <laughs> and you, we need to think about how to make this something that isn't going to take a lot of time, that's, that seems very personalized to you in your course. And so we ask them these two questions. We first say, what can you work on in a course that is sustainable in that you use it time and time again, across semesters, across quarters? Um, I have found faculty who want to focus on something in their course that's new and innovative, but they haven't yet tried. And so they try to make that accessible. And then when it doesn't work in their course, they have to kind of throw out their accessibility work because they're no longer using that thing. Um, so what is sustainable in your course? And then also thinking about what aspect of your course is most core to student success. And so if you're thinking, I have all of these touch points with my students, where do I focus my attention? Um, thinking about your student learning outcomes, thinking about that final destination of where you want them to get um, and thinking about what aspects of my course 
directly feed into that success and focusing um, your time on those pieces of what you do. And so this is um, a bitly I'm link. For it now. I'm yeah, I keep sorry. trying to stall it, but I'm this, sorry. This system all day has been just a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, so this is our open access public Moodle site where we have, and Gloria has kind of called together all of our practices that we um, give to our colleagues, to our faculty colleagues on what you can do with certain aspects of your course to make them accessible. Um, so HTTP, um, it's a bit.ly slash accessibility tutorial. Um, you might need an enrollment key to get in there and it's small steps. So what you see in that Moodle site is a collection of anything from how to go about captioning YouTube videos to how to make Word documents accessible for screen readers to what you can do within Moodle as an LMS to make sure that individuals are kind of using that in a way that's most helpful to them. And we just encourage you to think about those two questions for you or maybe how your faculty um, would be answering those questions for themselves to think about what aspects to focus on in that space. Another thing that might be of interest too, since we don't have um, just faculty, but we also have instructional designers or individuals with LMS spaces in here, is thinking about what else um, we might need to be thinking about. So if there are things that aren't touched upon in our Moodle site that you think would be interesting to pull information into that, um, that would be something we would love to know too. So with that, we wanted to give some time for exploration um, and for you to ask individualized questions that might be contextual to your job um, or your institution. Uh, and then we'll come back at the end to give um, kind of a roadmap or, and some stories about why we're continuing to do what we do. It will not. In about 10 seconds, it's going to move again. Yeah, so even, even so, even I guess not we, in prison. even, yeah, even not in presentation it's mode, it's just, it is berserk. It to go. Yeah. I'm going to uh, bring up that site. This is based in, in a Moodle site. You would want to create an account, and then you can go in and use the enrollment key. And we'll go back to that a second. If you're having trouble logging in, you can let us know, and we can help. The enrollment key is small steps, cap, both capital S's, small steps. But and one of the things that you'll find within here is that it goes from everything from how do I use Word, how do I make my syllabus accessible, to how do I caption videos on my YouTube site, to how do I um, use PowerPoint in an accessible way for students with um, vision or other... Um, need. So we really, um, Gloria has developed a tool that allows us as faculty to come alongside other faculty and almost always we can find an answer to their question of whatever it is that they, that's the small thing that they want to work on. Um, sure. And I don't think I can open the Word document. Oh, there it is. Small step. And if you have questions for us specifically about how we got faculty involved or what we do and how we go about that process during this time too, we're happy to answer those questions as well. So if you um, if you go in and let's see if it'll let me So if they can uh, create an account okay and let me check here.
because we are not able to support and roll in this course. It, it almost sounds like it's not recognizing their account. Oh, you may need to go to your email to verify your account. And you did. Okay. So let me check this to make sure. <laughs> we run through all of them, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's your browser. Yeah. The nice thing about this, too, is like this happens. There, that was hidden. And I think it reassures them, right? There. Now you should get in. For some reason, that was hidden. How odd. So now you're in. Well, I hope. Okay. Apologies. I'm not sure. So I've just downloaded that Word document, and then I can start to work through some of the tasks where I could uh, create titles, or I could change a link by right-clicking on it. That should have worked. Or an image to right-click on it and be able to change to put in the um, alt text. The other thing that we have in the site is videos, which are made by Microsoft. So you can download a doc, and here are the videos. So in addition to a template, you could literally just watch a one or two minute video from Microsoft and look at, uh, usually they have below here, let me go over one more. They'll give uh, some text description as well. So play a video and read all about it. Other than, um, so the way that I described the Accessibility Ambassadors Program uh, sounded a lot like when we buy in, then we're just crossing our fingers that other people will buy in too um, and come to our brown bag sessions. One thing we started doing as well is um, inserting ourselves into the new faculty orientation. Um, and so from the get-go, our new faculty are um, thinking about accessibility practices, getting a little bit of a primer on how to do that before they even start getting into our LMS and building their courses. Um, and so although some, some of what we do is hoping that other people are interested and want to engage in accessibility um, practices for professional development, we also are putting ourselves in places too um, where we're kind of putting the value in people's ear of this being important and also giving an idea about good outcomes. We also have um, a little video. If you have a YouTube channel, you could download that short video, upload it into your YouTube, and walk through captioning, how to caption your video. Using YouTube tool, is that what That's right. Mm -hmm. It has improved dramatically. Uh, they've uh, replaced their analytics with artificial intelligence, and it's incredible incredibly accurate. If you have a, especially screencasts, if faculty are doing screencasts in a quiet room, it's amazingly accurate. Mm -hmm. And then you can go in and edit it. Mm -hmm. So, and then we have tutorials on that, how to go in and edit. So you can start to see where um, you can control this thing and not make it overwhelm you, but choose one item to start to use, and then come back, choose another.
Do any of your institutions use Ally? Anyone? Do you use Ally? It's it's owned by Blackboard, correct? It was acquired. It was acquired <laughs> by Blackboard. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But uh, but they're not just supporting that product. They're, they're it's its own platform. They don't need Blackboard. It integrates with all, all elements. Yeah. They're trying to even do it for basic web uh, web presence or design. Right. Do you guys use it? You know, we are not using it, but I did ask Anna, whose last name escapes me, who presented it. Yes. I talked with her and asked the question. She immediately went to, well, are you helping the, and I said, yes, we actually have the liaisons, the, the ambassadors, and she said, great. She said, then I do recommend Ally in that it will show up back with you right away. This is, this is wrong, something's wrong here. Um, and they won't get overwhelmed or upset because they know they have colleagues or there are people around who are learning how to do this. We're creating that culture of uh, you don't have to know, you turn and ask someone and we will help you. As opposed to, I'm supposed to know this now, that kind of thing. So she said they can be very beneficial that way. And then also we get the, uh, the analytics on the back that tell you know, the percentage of things that are, are compliant and what isn't for institutional purposes. So who would you have your new course, for example? Yeah, you, you speak to that best. Yeah, so we kind of did the opposite of what you guys started grassroots, and, and we tried that method, but we couldn't get it on the ball. It was just with the right combination of people. Yeah. And so we said, well, we'll, we'll try the, the, you know, we'll try Ally, deploy it, and, and see how much of a stir we can. We'll ask for forgiveness. We'll see. <laughs> So, you know, we, we were conscious, we, we told them there's a way to turn it off, we're going to turn it on by default, but if you, you, know, if you want to turn it off, and you can still get the institutional reporting. Um, and what we found is it's, it's, it's starting a conversation. So it's the, the tool is not bulletproof. Right. The way in which it walks uh, instructors through how to make corrections gets only so far, and then it really falls flat. Um, because it's so complex, you're, you're asking people to redesign materials um, in a way that makes it more accessible. Um, but in terms of, of marking it and checking it and basically being able to sort of score and see where the most need is, so the courses that have the most students with the most un, like I said, inaccessible content it suddenly becomes um, very high priority. So for my institution, what we'll end up doing is writing a, um, an analysis of this. I will hand it to the dean of the libraries, who could then take it on to the provost, and they would determine, do the deans need to look at this? We, we did this sort of thing with uh, Turn It In. Highly controversial for us because of some of the uh, unintended communication it may deliver to students. Uh, so we're very sensitive to that. But, and, and it did go to the deans on a, a year annual basis uh, with a poll, an annual poll, where they would determine, are we going to do this or not? And then they finally made a decision one year, yes, we're going to implement it, and went institution-wide. Uh, so we do do the same thing with this. Before we just plug it into the LMS, we make sure that whoever needed to communicate about it can. And so if the deans communicate, it trickles on down, through the entire system so that faculty, staff, everyone knows it's coming before we throw the switch. In case in case there could be mm -hmm. some. And it's yeah. I assume with your grassroots effort, I mean you're using PowerPoint accessibility checker and word. So that's right. Checker. Yep, and that's all in there. In those um, uh, we rely on the Microsoft because they're doing a beautiful job. Yeah. And then we create that little template so I don't have to come up with my own document in the moment if we're in a workshop. I can download that and sit and play with it. Mm -hmm. And in the playing, I can start to feel comfortable. So the first thing they can see is how to go find that accessibility, you know, go to review, hit accessibility checker, and then see what kind of reporting it does give you and where you might start to feel like you should have people around you <laughs> who can help you to interpret what that means. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that templates do for us is Sometimes faculty approach this and they think, I have to redo everything I've ever done ever. And the template gives us a space in which
which to say, probably not sustainable or practical, but now you have a tool to move forward with. Now you have a space to interact with and people, and you know, there are often five or six of us in a, in a brown bag or whatever the format is, um, to support you with um, developing documents from this point forward that are accessible. Um, and that was a hard, it was a really hard to give myself grace to say, I know I still have documents in my courses that aren't accessible, but right now I'm focusing on anything new that I create and the, the PowerPoints and things that I use in my online <coughs> courses, right? Like I'm allowing myself to just keep this something that's manageable and that I will continue to do instead of throwing my hands up and saying, I, this is too big, I can't do it anymore. And mm -hmm. that's something that is really hard to model for our colleagues because I, I want to do it all. I want to do it all and I want to do it all right now and that it just, it just can't be. So because we're being proactive about it, we have a way to say, look, here are these tools for you to be proactive as you move forward. Um, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes it does help lift that, like, I can't go back and redo everything I've done. More of a technical note again. So for PDF, do you use the Adobe product, or do you, what are you using to check? Adobe PDF? Pro, and usually those are going to go to disability services because they're not monsters. And Anna was saying um, that's low on on, um, on the formats that you want to use. Probably for screen readers, number one, HTML that's done well. But after that, it's words. And we have speakers who specifically ask for word documents because they are formatted better. Um, and it all depends on how you save that PDF. And even then, there are issues with the PDFs. So, yeah. And then at our institution, we also installed software on two of our main uh, printer scanners in our, in our two libraries so that faculty and students can do the OCR scanning and send an actual text PDF to themselves as opposed to the usual image. Yeah, so we're, we're, we got the repo, I believe it is. Oh, no, we're not repo. I can't remember what we are, but we researched that and got the software installed. Yeah. As a faculty member, too, it's nice that we, ha we have an individual in the learning support services digital or disability services office who, um, if I have a PDF that is not accessible, it's just one big chunk of something, and I don't have the original book to go ahead and rescan and do it in our programming, I can send it to her and she can run it through her programming to, to change that to make it accessible for me. Um, and so part of our job too is letting our faculty colleagues know when they don't have to do it by themselves and there's someone who is there to do it for them if need be. Um, so in the past, we've had people need captioning for YouTube videos and say, I don't have time to do this. Um, we talk about how like a work study, that's like a great job um, for them to do if they need something to do. You can have a student do that. Um, but also that there could be like a third party service, like a vendor that we can send it out to to get that caption to. Um, so letting people know about the other individuals in our circle who can help with certain aspects of things so that faculty don't feel like they have to figure it all out themselves has been helpful. So for those time sensitive things, like when there's an actual accommodation need, that's when uh, mm -hmm. we can contact IT, send those videos out, get them done within 24 hours, that sort of thing. And disability services is very responsive, mm -hmm. but they have a heavy load already, mm -hmm. you know, in all sorts of terms. So anything we can do to make our content start to become accessible as we go will help them. Mm -hmm. So Miranda and I wanted to share our two quick stories that we kind of rely on um, as kind of showcases of what our work is doing as being effective. Um, these are things that we share with our colleagues too. So the summer after the May workshop, um, I first of all was very um, recently out of grad school and I think I still had a little pep in my step of like how much I was going to do at once and so I came out of May that May workshop and I was like you said small steps but I'm just gonna do an entire course um, because that's what I'll do and so um, I picked my most difficult course to make accessible so 
I teach Introduction to Communication Research Methods, um, which is a course focused on research design and um, statistics and analytics. And um, a lot of our communication majors have a little draw dropping of, I have to take a class with math. That's not why I got into this. Um, and so there's a lot of like anxiety and hesitancy going into that class to begin with. And so if I had a course that was difficult to navigate or that wasn't accessible in certain ways, that's just adding an additional barrier to my students and their success. And so I chose that course um, thinking in that line of thinking of this is my hardest course and I need to, I need to focus on it. And then um, that fall, I had a student enrolled in my course who on the very first day kind of came up to me a little hesitant to say, I have a lot of accommodation requests. You're going to be getting a rather lengthy email from Disability Services, but I really want to do well in your course. Um, I need X, Y, and Z in order to be successful. Can you work with me to do that? Um, and my heart stopped a little bit and I said, I've actually already done that. Um, I have things in place in my course for you to succeed. And I thought of you um, as I was doing this course without knowing like who you actually were. We had an emotional moment. Our bond was, was strong from the beginning. Um, but she said, you know, by having a faculty member say, I already have these things in place, they felt known um, as a, a type of student that might be entering their space instead of seeing that person as um, someone who's adding extra to that faculty member's load. And so um, she said things like, you know, this was the easiest conversation I've ever had to have. I didn't feel like I was being a nuisance. You were already ready um, and provided a learning environment that got me ready to learn. Luckily, she then was one of my advisees. And so I could see kind of her course map coming um, for me individually so that I could focus on other courses too, to say, I know you're taking this course next, so let that be my next project in terms of getting that ready as well. Um, took smaller steps in the future of not totally redoing a course, but by then I, I knew aspects of my course that are going to be core to her success. Um, and in the course evaluations at the end of the semester for that course, um, they were better than previous evaluations in the course in terms of students learning. And so it wasn't just that one student that I was impacting, it was the entire class by providing a more accessible environment to my digital content. They were learning more um, and learning better and being more successful in what they do. So it was a, uh, a really interesting um, and pleasant situation for me. Um, and I, I tell my colleagues, you know, that's not going to happen for you. You're not going, you might not pick a course and magically that's the one that you needed to pick. But um, thinking about extending what you do to other students and not just the students that are coming in with those accommodation requests, I think is, is super helpful. So that's the one that keeps me doing this work um, that I'm doing. My hope is a little bit different. Um, Courtney, we ended in May term. She jumped in. She's like, I'll doing all this stuff. And I was like, one thing. They said one thing. <laughs> you pick one listen. thing. I can do one thing. So I picked one thing. And it was a very small. Um, it was simply to ensure that any videos I used or made included captions that were intelligible um, and that actually matched what was happening in the, the uh, video. And um, I didn't really think anything of that. It was a very small thing. It was something that was a lot of work for me in the background, but the students didn't, like, I, well, students, they, they, they don't really know, whatever, it's fine. Until one um, class, we were watching a video, and I had failed to turn the um, captions on, and a student came to me and said, is there any way that you could turn the captions on? They're really helpful for me. Not, not a student who needs accommodation, not a student who needs anything, just a student who recognized, I am a better learner with this tool. And then, which was, it was very exciting uh, for me as a faculty member to see the student feel empowered, slightly different than what you were talking about of having to beg for things, right? But more of a, I know this is a safe space to ask for this. And then that same student proceeded to, in future courses, not with me, but with other faculty members, to ask for that same thing. It's really helpful for me as a learner if the, the video kept captioning, I can pause them, I can read it, I can do all these different things. Um, and so that was this very small, one little small thing that I had committed to do for that academic year 
that made a difference for this one particular student and I know made a difference for other students as well. Mm -hmm. um, even though I didn't have this demand coming down from um, the disability service officer or some um, other judicial unit saying, you must do this, right? And so it helped keep me wanting to go forward with one small thing at a time, giving myself permission to do that one small thing um, and supporting my colleagues with that one small thing as well. So in thinking about small things, we um, would like to uh, end our time together today just thinking about each of you um, play a different role and in a different space in a different way. So um, some of you are like, I have this accessibility thing down pat, but I really want to think more about how do I start to have this conversation? Who's the one key person I could go <coughs> back and have a conversation with about the idea of an accessibility ambassador or whatever it would be called in the culture of your institution. Um, or maybe you are sitting here thinking, okay, one small step, one class, one small thing I can do from now until the end of the term or at the start of next term or whatever the case may be. Um, but we'd like to give you just a, a few minutes as we end here to think through those pieces. And if it works for your brain to talk with somebody else, um, certainly take advantage of other brains in the room, or if you are in a space at 310 on Friday afternoon that you just need a few minutes, you and your notebook totally get that too. Um, and Courtney and I are, will just be kind of lingering about eavesdropping and all those good things um, to answer any remaining questions or things that you might have. So thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully there was one small spark of something that uh, you want to take back and this is the time to kind of think about that. that we're doing or something we're trying to do. We're trying to 
feeling, right? Because I sometimes I think like I've got this figured out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this computer could read nothing. I totally mess this up, you know. Um, I think the more of that conversation that people get as people that are on the fence are starting to think more about well, I, I, I could do one small proactive thing as opposed to slowing in that like the idea that it's just too hard. I'm just going to do what I do. Yeah. And it's also why we're on the fence because we don't need to keep doing so that you don't get in a pattern of this is the way that I've done this. And so you're making me do the leadership by thinking and how it's me. Versus start thinking about your team dollars and blah 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 or like it's yeah, registration for next year. That's what it is. Yeah. It's probably helpful for someone, you know? Yes. Probably. Maybe. So was it me or was that Yeah. Okay. I was just like, this is like possible the next thing I've ever done at a professional workshop. Okay. Well